Hey guys, it's Virginia here with practice exam 3C. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, so stay positive. You guys can rock this exam. Again, if you need to contact me, you can find me at lecture, office hours, various sessions, or you can email me at that email there. Just as a reminder, it's much better if you go through this exam beforehand and if you've gotten out paper and a pencil and a calculator to take notes and go through this actively rather than watching me do it even though I make it look so fun. Okay, so let's get into it. The first question asks, which of the following species will have a negligible effect on the pH of a solution? When I read negligible effect, I just think it won't affect the pH. And species that are negligible must have come from a strong acid or base. Okay. And so we can just go through this list and see which would have come from a strong acid or base. So BrO- minus is negative. So to make that neutral, we can add a proton to it and have HBrO. And so we know HBrO is a weak acid because it's not one of our seven strong acids. If you haven't memorized your strong acids or bases yet, just do it. It's worth it. Okay. So because this is a weak acid, this will be a weak base and would have an effect on the pH. So that's out. Cl- would be the result of HCl dissociation. HCl is a strong acid, which means that Cl- would be a negligible base. So this seems like a good option for this question. Let's go through the other three options. We have NH4+, and we know that NH4+, is the result of ammonia hydrolyzing water to form NH4 plus and OH minus. So NH4 plus is the conjugate acid of this weak base. So it would have an effect on the pH because it is a weak acid. CO3 minus, I'll draw over here, but CO3 minus is the conjugate base of HCO3 minus dissociating to form proton and HCO3 to minus. So this is also the conjugate base of a weak acid, so it would have an effect on the pH. Similarly, this acetate ion would be the result of acetic acid dissociating to form a proton. Oops, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. So it would dissociate to form a proton and a CH3COO- ion. So since this is the conjugate base of a weak acid, it would also have an effect on the pH. So that leaves us with B as the answer because B is the only ion that would be the conjugate of something that is strong.
Problem two is a throwback to our days of thermodynamics, but now we're working with a system that involves an acid dissociation. So I've written here some equations that you can find on the data sheet. They should look familiar because we use them for our exam two material. But here we have delta G equals delta G naught plus RT ln Q, which is our reaction quotient. And we have delta G standard equals negative RT ln KEQ. Okay, so here they're asking us to find this delta G. They give us a K, a pH, concentrations of the acid and its conjugate. So what we can do is use the K and the second equation to figure out what the delta G standard would be. So we can set this up. Delta G standard is equal to negative and the R we'll use is the 0 0.008314 kilojoules per mole Kelvin. The temperature needs to be in Kelvin, so that would be 298 Kelvin times the natural log of the K. So 3.98 times 10 to the minus 4. And when you get out your calculator and evaluate that right now, you'd find that this is equal to 19.4 kilojoules. Okay, so now we can plug that in up here into our first equation. But something else we need to know for our first equation is the Q. And so Q we know is reaction quotient and it will take the form similar to K NO2 minus H plus over HNO2. The thing with Q is we can plug concentrations from any point in the reaction into it, our calculation. And so what we can do is just plug in these values as they are into our Q calculation and we can use pH to figure out what our H plus concentration is. Okay, so our concentration of H plus is going to be equal to 10 to the power of negative 8.2 and that is equal to 6.31 times 10 to the negative 9 molar. So our Q now expression will be our given 6.2 times 10 to the minus 4 times that H plus concentration. Divided by our HNO2 concentration, which is the 0.25. Don't forget that Q is equal to negative, I'm sorry, is equal to, sorry, 1.54 or 56 times 10 to the negative 11. And so now we also know the Q. So we can, we have all the variables required to solve this first expression. So our delta G will be equal to our delta G standard, which we found to be 19.4 kg. 
kilojoules plus RT which is the 0 0.008314 kilojoules per mole Kelvin Two ninety eight Kelvin now Ln of the one point five six times ten to the negative eleven. And then when you evaluate this, it ends up being negative forty two point two four kilojoules per mole, which is equal to C. So this is just a reminder to never est underestimate our abilities to pull in old material and mix it with our current material. Okay, so don't forget about thermodynamics. And make okay, so problem three is asking us to figure out how many electrons are transferred in this redox reaction. So our first step is going to be to assign oxidation numbers. So the first compound, just the aluminum solid, whenever you have one atom by itself, its oxidation number is just going to be the charge, which is zero. The same is true for the cadmium solid over there. And then do you guys realize how the nitrate is together on the left and together on the right? What's nice about those polyatomic ions is when they stay together like that, we can just call this whole thing minus one. So if we call the nitrate minus one, then to make this compound overall neutral, the cadmium has to be plus two. Plus two. And then we can use the same logic over here for the aluminum nitrate. Nitrate's going to be minus one. There's three of them, so the aluminum would be plus three. And then we can look at the individual half reactions regarding what's being reduced and what's being oxidized. And so compounds that are reduced will have gained electrons. And so they will appear more negative or appear as if they're getting less positive. And so in this situation it's going to be the cadmium because it's starting as plus two and gaining two electrons to become zero. So we can write cadmium NO3 two. It's gaining two electrons to become cadmium salt. Okay. Then we can look at what's being oxidized. And the oxidized species loses electrons. So we want to look for the thing that becomes more positive. So in this case it's going to be the aluminum because it goes from zero to plus three. Aluminum solid. Going to Aluminum plus three. And it loses three electrons in that process to go from zero to plus three. Okay. And in our balanced reaction, we eventually need to combine these two reactions together. And right now they're not balanced. Our electrons aren't balanced. Our nitrates aren't balanced. And so the way we'll do that 
make them balanced is to multiply this whole top reaction by 3 and this whole bottom reaction by 2. Okay. And so we could go on to get the full balanced reaction. But this question is really just asking us about how many electrons are transferred. And hopefully you guys can see that in the top reaction we're gaining 6 electrons. And in the bottom reaction, we'd be losing six, six electrons, which would be balanced. So the answer here is just six. So you should be sure to avoid the temptation to just add the two and the three together to get five. And make sure that the number of electrons that are lost is the same number of electrons gained eventually we can't just create or destroy electrons. For number four, it's asking us to rank the salts by molar solubility given their KSPs. And the molar solubility is really referring to the X value that we would get from doing our ice tables. And so what we're going to end up having to do is an ice table for each of these three salts. So let's start with the barium fluoride, BAF2 solid, will be in equilibrium with BA2 plus aqueous and two moles of F minus aqueous. And so we're going to do an ice table where we ignore our BAF2 because it's a solid, so it's not going to be involved in our equilibrium expression. We start with zero for the barium and fluoride. And then our change is going to be plus X for the barium. But for fluoride, it's going to be plus 2X. Okay, so don't forget about the stoichiometry. And we're going to need that stoichiometry up here when we think about what our KSP expression actually is. So the KSP is just going to be barium ions concentration times the fluoride ions concentration squared. Okay, so again, pay attention to the stoichiometry. And we're ignoring the barium fluoride because it's a solid, so we can just call it 1. So now we can say that this is x times 2x squared, which is really going to be 4x cubed. And then we can set that equal to the KSP value of 1.7 times 10 to the minus 6. So just a, another quick reminder to do these problems with the calculator that you'll use during the exam to make sure you know how to take the third root of something on the calculator. Okay, okay. so when you solve that we find that x is equal to 7.52 times 10 to the negative 3. So this will be its molar, molar solubility. So I'm going to write that up here next to the salt. Maybe. 7.52 times 10 negative third molar. Okay, so that's the molar solubility for barium fluoride. And we're going to do, take the same approach for the next salt, the calcium sulfate. Okay, 
Okay, so we now instead have calcium sulfate solid. Calcium sulfate will break into Ca2+. and one mole of SO4, two minus. Ignore the solid still. And then for the calcium and the sulfate, we're starting with zero, plus X, X, plus X, X. The KSP will just be equal to calcium ion concentration times sulfate ion concentration. This is equal to 2.4 times 10 to the minus 5. And so that's going to be equal to x squared. So it's easy then to get x and find that it's equal to 4.90 times 10 to the minus 3 molar. Okay, so that's its molar solubility. So this is 4.9 times 10 to the minus 3 molar. Okay, so we can already see that the molar solubility for the barium fluoride was higher for that of the or higher than that of the calcium sulfate. Oops. Oh well. Okay, so now we just have one more. This cobalt sulfide, just a strange compound. We'll have COS solid in equilibrium with CO. 2 plus. If you need help figuring out what the charges should be, um, come to office hours or something. We can show you how to predict those. Okay, so again, ignore the solid. That's easy. 0, 0, plus x, plus x, x, x. Our KSP be equal to the concentration of the cobalt cations, sulfide anion concentration. So that's this 4.2 times 10 to the minus 8. That'll be equal to x squared. So again, pretty easy to find x, just take the square root. And we get 2.05 times 10 to the minus 4. Okay. So now that we've figured out all of their molar solubilities, we can just compare them get our ranking straight. But you do want to be careful to make sure you don't have the rank the ordering backwards. So I always just write low, high. And so the smallest molar solubility is going to be the third one. The highest is the first one. And so it's just going to be that, which is option choice C. Okay. You do want to be sure to go ahead and do the ice tables, because if you just rank them by the KSPs, you wouldn't get the same answer. And that kind of is the result of the stoichiometry of the salts. Okay, calcium hydroxide. What kind of compound is... 
Okay, so now we have another solubility problem. And so we have calcium hydroxide solid dissolving to get calcium ions and hydroxide ions. So we're going to do something really similar to what we did last time because our end goal is to figure out the concentration of hydroxide ions which we can use to get pOH which we can then use to get pH. So let's go ahead and make an ice table for this. We're going to ignore the calcium hydroxide because it's a solid. Our initial values here are going to be zero, minus x, or I'm sorry, plus x, plus 2x, so we'll have x and 2x. Our KSP is going to be equal to the concentration of the calcium ions times that of the hydroxide ions squared. Okay, it's really important to not forget that the two out front results in that square. So our KSP will end up looking like x times 2x squared which is the same as 4x cubed. We know that that's equal to 8 times 10 to the minus 6. Okay, make sure you can take the cubed root on your 112 calculator to find that x is equal to 1.26 times 10 to the negative 2 molar. And so that would directly give us the calcium concentration, but we know that we have a 2 for the hydroxide. So our calcium, or our hydroxide concentration is going to be equal to 2 times that 1.26 times 10 to the minus 2. And it will be sorry, it will be equal to two point five two times ten to the negative two molar. So we take the negative log of that to find POH. So our POH is equal to one point six. So that makes our pH 14 minus 1.6, which is just going to be 12.4. Just see. Okay, so this is just a typical equilibrium problem with the KSP, except we use that molar solubility to find the concentration of something that affects the pH. And then we just use our normal acid-base theory to get to pH. Okay, here we have an organic base with a fun name. And they give us the pH, or they want us to figure out the pH of the solution given the Kb of this molecule. Okay, so I've written here the base hydrolysis. Don't forget that for bases, you have to react them with water. So I just wrote a shortened name for this acid, or this base, plus water. The base takes the proton and leaves behind hydroxide. Okay, and so we have a weak base. We want pH, so we can go ahead and ice it out. Okay, so our initial concentration is 1.5 molar for that.
We'll ignore the water, starting with zero of those guys. Minus x plus x plus x. Okay. And so then we can plug that into our Kb because we know that Kb is going to be the, our hydroxide concentration times our protonated benzimidazole. divided by the, our original concentration, or our original species. So here, we'll have x squared over 1.5 minus x. But because this Kb is so small, we can go ahead and ignore that minus x and just have 1.5. Okay, so we would multiply the 1.5 over, then take the square root to find that x is equal to 7.73 times 10 to the minus 5. Molar. And I like to remind myself that that's going to be the concentration of hydroxide. Because then, when I go ahead and take the negative log of that value, I remember that I'll be finding pOH. When you do that, you get a pOH of 4.11. The pH will then be just 14 minus that number, which is 9.89. which is E. Okay, for number seven, they want us to figure out at a titration curve which would have a pH less than seven at the equivalence point. Okay, so that would mean it would be acidic at the equivalence point. And so, real quickly, I'd like to just say that if you titrate two strong things together, so strong acid with a strong base, your equivalence pH will always be 7, because at that equivalence point, you only have water and the negligible counter ions. When you have originally a weak acid and you add a strong base to it, at that equivalence point, you end up having sum of your conjugate base, A minus in solution, and you have some water, and the counter ion from your strong base, which is negligible. And so because you have this weak base present, the pH at the equivalence point in this situation is going to be greater than 7. When you have a weak base titrated with a strong acid, at the equivalence point, you used up everything, but you're left with some of your conjugate acid now and water. So because the conjugate acid is there, that will affect the pH and make it less than 7. Okay. So we want to look for a titration that's 
a weak base and a strong acid. Okay, so looking at A, we have HCl and NaOH. Those are both strong, so that pH would be a 7. Here we have acetic acid, which is weak, titrated with a strong base. So that would actually fit the second scenario where our pH would be greater than 7. Okay, HCN is also a weak acid. NaOH is a strong base. So, nope. Here we have the C6H5NH2 titrated with HBr. And so whenever you have a nitrogen with three bonds like it has there, that's going to be a weak base. So this seems to check out. If we look at E, HClO3 is a strong acid. Calcium hydroxide is a strong base. So that one's out. Leaving us with just D. Okay, number eight, they give us a bunch of salts, and they want us to figure out which of the following salts will have a pH less than seven, a 25 degrees Celsius. So we want to find a salt that ends up being acidic. So let's go ahead and write out each dissociation and see what we're left with. So the first one will have NH4Cl. It dissolves to form NH4 plus and Cl minus. Cl minus is a spectator, so it won't have any effect on pH. But NH4 plus, this is the conjugate acid of NH3, which is a weak base, making NH4 plus a weak acid. I'll write up here, weak acid. And we do know that NH4 plus, when put into water, will form some H3O plus and that weak base. Okay, so number one seems like an option. Number two, calcium oxide. CaO will dissolve to form Ca2 plus and O2 minus. And this O2 minus we consider to be basic. Okay, so that rules the calcium oxide out. Okay, and then we have sodium nitrite. Sodium, spectator. Nitrite comes from HNO2, which is a weak acid. So that would make NO2 minus a weak base. So this would actually make the pH greater than 7. It's a weak base. So that's not a choice. And we can see that if we mix it with water, we get HNO2 and hydroxide. So that'll be basic. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, KClO4.
potassium comes from KOH, spectator. ClO4 minus would come from HClO4, which is a strong acid, so that's also a spectator. So this would have no effect on the pH. So it would just stay at 7. So that one's out. Okay, last one, we just have acetic acid. That's just a straight up weak acid. Okay, so that would also drop the pH. And so the correct answer is just those two. E. The classification stuff is really important. So I'd spend some time thinking about it, okay? I'll draw a star here. Okay. Number nine, we have ibuprofen. And they want us to figure out the Ka of ibuprofen if they give us a concentration and a pH. Okay. So we can do that. We can go ahead and still set up an ice table. So the thing with pH is that it will give us the equilibrium hydronium concentration. Okay, and that'll be useful for finding out other components. So we can set this up by saying just a normal ice table. So minus x. 0.55 minus x, ignore the water, 0 plus x, the deprotonated ibuprofen, 0 plus x, x. And so what the pH does for us is if we go 10 to the power of negative 2.58 we find that this is 2.63 times 10 to the negative 3 molar and it will just be equal to our H3O plus concentration And what's interesting about our H3O plus concentration is that that is just equal to X. And so now we can take that number and use it to get the values be below. So I'm just... I'm going to ignore the minus X like we normally do here and just say that we 0.55 for the original ibuprofen. 2.63 times 10 to the negative 3 here. And then 2.63 times 10 to the negative 3. So then our Ka will just be equal to. 2.63 oh, times 10 to the negative 3 squared divided by 0.55. And if you want to, you can subtract the x. So then when you solve that, you end up getting b which is the 1.26 times 10 to the negative 5. Okay. We have a titration enthusiast. Not sure I've ever met someone who considers themselves to be a titration enthusiast, but hey, I'm sure they're out there. 
So they're mixing lactic acid with KOH, just for the thrill of it. And they want us to figure out what the pH is at the equivalence point. Okay, so these are the long problems. And if you get to a problem for an equivalence point titration on the exam, feel free to save it for the end because it will take you a while and be a little bit draining. And there's scratch paper provided on the exam, so if you want to use that piece of paper for this, go for it. Okay, so the first step for these is to write out the equation. For the reaction. Okay, so we have another titration problem. Except this is like the boss fight of titration problems, as Todd would say, because it's an equivalence point titration. And so we want to remember that at the equivalence point, our moles of acid are going to be equal to our moles of base. Equal. Equivalence. Bam. And so we can, should start always by writing the reaction, as I have here. But I just wrote OH- in for our strong base, since the potassium is just going to dissociate and float away and mind its own business. Okay, and whenever we have a reaction, we want to compare in terms of moles. And whenever we do that, we use an ICF table. Okay, so to get moles, we're going to use the volume given and the concentration given. Okay, so I'm just going to write this once, but if we have half a liter, we know from the concentration that we'll have two moles of our acid in one liter. So we have one mole of that lactic acid. So I'm just going to put a one there. And they don't tell us how many moles of hydroxide we're adding because they just give us a concentration. But we know that it needs to be the same so this is also going to be one. Okay, we'll kind of ignore the water. Say that we're starting with zero of the conjugate base also. And so these are going to be totally used up. And we'll make one mole of the conjugate base. Okay. So that's all well and good, but they want us to find pH, and to do that, we need some kind of acid-base dissociation. The only thing we've left in solution that will affect pH is this conjugate base. So we can take that, and write its... how it behaves in water. So we'll make hydroxide and that original lactic acid molecule. And then we know that in these situations we're going to ice it out. When we ice, we need concentrations. And here, I just have moles. So we need to think about what our total volume is going to be. So we started with the 500 mils. But we never stopped to think about how much of the hydroxide we're adding. And so we know we are adding one mole. And this concentration is nice because it's just one molar. So we know that we would just need one liter of that 
use this as saying one mole in one liter. So our final volume is just going to be 1.5 liters. So our molarity of this conjugate base is going to be one mole divided by 1.5 liters, which is 0.66 molar. And then we can just ice it out like normal, both minus x, 0, 0, plus x, plus x, x, x. Okay. And so once we reach this point, use the Ka and then I kind of wrote over it but it's 1.4 times 10 to the minus 4 and that's going to be equal oh wait no we can't use the Ka for this right because what kind of reaction did I write I wrote a base hydrolysis right? We have a base reaction. So we need a KB. But that's okay because we can find that. Because we know that KW is equal to KA times KB. So our KB it's going to be KW divided by the KA. And so the KB ends up being 7.14 times 10 to the negative 11. Okay, so that was easy to find, right? We just had to do a quick division. And so now that we have our KB, thanks to KW, we can say that 7.14 times 10 to the negative 11 is equal to x squared over 0.66 minus x. And then as per usual, we can ignore that, multiply this over, take the square root, and find that x is equal, x is equal to 6.87 times 10 to the negative 6. And like I've said, I like to remind myself that that's actually the concentration of hydroxide. Because when you go ahead and take the negative log of that, we'll have pOH. So pOH ends up being equal to 5.16. And so pH will be equal to 14 minus 5.16, which is going to be oh, equal to 8.84. So there's a lot of steps with these problems. You have to start with your reaction and work in terms of moles. Then get your final volume and then make an ice table in terms of molarity. Use your find your KB and then use it and then get pOH and then get that to pH. 
So there's a lot of moving parts here. So be sure to take your time and make sure you're keeping track of all the pieces. And like I said, you can get out the scrap paper from the back of the exam packet or you can wait and skip this problem, come back to it at the end after you've knocked out all of the easy ones. Okay, and if you can do these, you can do any acid-base problem. Okay, so these are a good test for yourself. And you can use the titration app in the ebook also to test yourself. Okay, so here we have a beaker and it has all of these different salts mixed together in it. And we're going to drop in some lead nitrate and they want us to pick out which will precipitate first. And so what ends up happening is when we add the lead nitrate, the lead can then go on to react with either the bromine, fluorine, chlorine already in solution. And so how you end up thinking about this is knowing that whichever one is least soluble will be the one that precipitates out of solution first. Okay, because we just reach its threshold at a lower concentration. And so really all you have to do for this is know that the lower KSP means that you're less soluble and that you'll precipitate faster. So looking at these values, PBF2 has the, the lowest KSP. So that will precipitate out first. So the answer here is just E. For number 12, we have some salt solutions, and they want us to pick which one will give us the highest pH. And as I've marked here, the highest pH will be the most basic. So the most basic thing would either have to be a strong base or be the conjugate base of the weakest acid. Okay, so if we look at A, this will give us ClO2 minus. And if we want to think about its conjugate. The conjugate would be HClO2. We can go through this process for all of them. Okay, so now we've written out the conjugate acids that would correspond to all of the anions here. So what I like to do first is just go through and know that I want something that's weak, so I may as well eliminate all of the strong acids. So HCl4 is strong, so we'll get rid of that. HCl is strong, so they would have spectators as their conjugates. They would have no effect on the pH. Okay, so that leaves us with some different halogen, oxygen, acid combinations. Okay. So the first thing we want to look at in terms of strength is the oxygen, or I'm sorry, is the halogen. Okay, so more 
electronegative halogen would correspond to a stronger acid. Okay, so then we can look between chlorine and bromine. So chlorine is more electronegative than bromine. So this acid here would be stronger than the bromine acids. It'd still be weak, but it would be stronger compared to those. So it would have a weaker conjugate base. And we here we're trying to find the strongest conjugate base. Okay, and so now we're down to the two bromine acids. So we know that if we add on more oxygens, that it'll be stronger. And so here, the HBrO4 will be stronger than HBrO2. And we want the one that's weakest. So we can eliminate that answer. Okay. So what this really tells me is that H BrO2 will dissociate into H plus and the BrO2 minus. And this is, it's still a weak base, but it's stronger than the other conjugate bases. Okay, making C the correct answer here. So that's a little bit of exam two throwback again. So don't forget that we can do that sometimes. Okay. So this is material from Wednesday and Friday right before the exam. Where we have kind of two things going on. We can see that the silver iodide is dissolving kind of to form silver in the iodide. We also see that CN minus is hooking up with that Ag plus to create this metal ligand complex. And they want us to get the equilibrium constant for the reaction. So what I did they give us the two K values. We have a KSP and a KF. So I just wrote the expressions that would go along with those values. So KSP is when we're dissolving something. So we have our AGI solid dissolving to form AG plus and I minus. But KF is formation. So we're forming this metal ligand complex. So that's Ag plus plus our two cyanide ions. So what we have to do is see how we can combine those two equations to make the original expression up top. And so hopefully you can see that just as these two expressions are written, if we combine them, we'd cancel the silver and we'd just be left with the original equation. So we just have to combine those two. And when we combine expressions and want to combine the k's, we would do ksp times the kf to get our k overall. So we're just going to multiply 8.3 times 10 to the negative 17 times 1 times 10 to the 21. 
and that leaves us with E. And that's interesting because it tells us that the silver is going to favor this complex rather than being stuck together with the iodide because this reaction is products favored. Okay, so don't forget that exam two stuff where if we had to flip a reaction, we'd do one over the K. If we had a multiplier, we'd do the K to the power of the multi multiplier. All that good stuff. Palmitic acid. This is something I work with all the time in my lab work. So we have palmitic acid. It's involved in lipids. And they give us a Ka for that carboxylic acid at the end. And they just want us to get the pH of this solution. I've written the reaction with water down here. So we can go ahead and just ice it out. So we have point oh five molar ignoring water zero zero minus x plus x plus x zero point zero five minus x x x okay and so now we can just use the ka the so Ka, which is that 1.66 times 10 to the negative 5, is going to be equal to x squared over 0 0.05 minus x. We have a small enough k, so we can ignore the minus x. And then solve to find that x is equal to 9.1 times 10 to the negative 4. Okay, and again, I like to remind myself what that is, and that's the concentration of H+. Plus. So that's nice, because then we can just go ahead and take the negative log of that to get pH. And when we do that, we get a pH of about 3. Okay, sodium cyanide. Scary stuff. If you've ever listened to the podcast S-Town, they talk a little bit about sodium cyanide. Okay, so it's a poison, but people use it for gold. And they want us to figure out what the pH of a sodium cyanide solution would be. So I wrote the dissociation here to see that for every one sodium cyanide, we end up with one CN minus. And then we can take that CN minus, put it in water. And it will go through a base hydrolysis to make OH minus and HCN. And so we can ice it out. So our concentration here is going to be the 1.5 molar. Ignore water. Start with zero here, zero here, minus x, 1.5 minus x, plus x, plus x. Okay. And so they gave us Ka up here. But this was a base reaction. So we need KB. So we're going to use our KW relationship. If 
find that KB is going to be equal to 1 times 10 to the negative 14 divided by 6.2 times 10 to the negative 10. So KB is equal to 1.61 times 10 to the negative 5. So then we can take our KB Set it equal to the x squared over 1.5 minus x. And so we know that we can cancel the minus x, multiply the 1.5 over, take the square root, and get that x is equal to 4.9 times 10 to the negative 3. And that's going to be the concentration of hydroxide. So when we take the negative log of that, we'll get pOH. And that will be 2.31. So pH will be equal to... 14 minus 2.31, which is the 11.69, which is D. Okay, so just a nice table problem. The only thing is remembering to get your KB. Okay, they want pOH of a 0.025 molar solution of barium hydroxide. So what kind of species is barium hydroxide? Sorry, say that again. What was it? Oh, yeah, 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 you're right, you're right. That is a strong base. Okay. So the barium hydroxide will completely dissociate to form the ions. So if I have 0 0.025 moles of barium hydroxide in solution in one liter, and I'll get two moles of hydroxide out for every one of those. So my hydroxide concentration is going to be 0.05 molar. So then to get the pOH, I just take the negative log, and so the pOH is 1.3. And what's awesome is that for once they just wanted us to get pOH. So we're good with just leaving it as C. Okay, so that's a nice freebie problem. Okay. On the basis of these percent ionization, select which acid has the smallest Ka. Okay, so smallest Ka would mean weakest acid. So the way I think of percent ionization is, is like the concentration of the conjugate base I get compared to how much of the acid I started with. And then times the 100%. And so strength and percent ionization sort of go together. Is if we are stronger, we'll dissociate more. And make more ions. Okay. 
So we can just pick these based on the percent ionization. So the weakest will have the lowest percent ionization. And so that's just going to be D, the acetic acid. You can also see here that our strong acid was 100% ionized. Okay, so that could kind of be a clue to, to how strength would relate to ionization. For number 18, we have a solubility question. And they're asking us how adding in H plus affects it, because we're doing it in a more acidic solution. And so we can just go through and think about what would happen for each of these five salts. So I've written the equilibrium for the calcium phosphate. And so then we just have to think if either of these two species will go on to react with the H+. Calcium not so much, but we can take phosphate, add a proton to it, and make HPO4 2 minus. And then we can take that and add a proton to it. Get H2PO4 minus. And then we can take that and add a proton to it to make H3PO4. And we can do that because these are all weak acids here. So there is a reverse route to making them. So when we do that, we're effectively removing the phosphate from solution. Okay, because if it's caught up in any of these three molecules, it won't be able to go back to make calcium phosphate again. And so if we're removing the phosphate from solution, Le Chatelier tells us that we'll shift our reaction to the right to kind of fill in that void. And so in doing that, this would be more soluble because of the acid. Okay. So that first one checks out. We can go ahead and make this kind of evaluation for all of the solids given. Okay, so we now look at the iron hydroxide. Okay, so we have this equilibrium, and we want to look to see if either of our products will react with the protons. Iron won't really, but hydroxide will definitely go on to react with H+. And it'll make water. And that's at equilibrium, and we have the Kw for that. Okay, and so because that will go on to react, we'll be decreasing the amount of that product and shifting the equilibrium to the right. Okay, so this would also increase the solubility. Silver bromide. OK, 
Okay, so we have to see if either of those will react with the protons. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't really know anything about silver and hydrogen reacting. And so, when we look at the bromide, we know that HBr exists, right? But HBr is strong, so this is a one-directional arrow to form H plus and Br minus. There's no way for these to recombine and go back. That's not going to happen. Okay, so even if we add in protons, they won't be able to suck up this bromide. Okay, so the H plus will have no effect on the solubility of this. So that guy's out. Okay, so now we have the strontium carbonate equilibrium. Strontium's not going to react with um, the protons. We can take the carbonate and add a proton to it. And it will react to form this HCO3 minus, the bicarbonate. And then that bicarbonate can find another proton and react to form carbonic acid. Okay, so again, we would have the protons reacting with the carbonate to effectively remove it from this equilibrium, shifting things toward products. So it would increase the solubility. Now we have copper iodide dissolving. The copper won't react with the protons. And neither will the iodide. And this is for the same reason that the bromide did it. HI, whilst being the friendliest of acids, is also a strong acid with a one directional arrow. So again, there's no way for these to recombine to form the HI. Okay, so the H plus won't be able to take the I minus out of this equilibrium. So it will just stay the same. Okay, so that makes our answer choices 1, 2, and 4, which would be D. Okay, so for these, you just want to write out the dissolutions. And then think about if either of those components can react with the protons. In number 19, they tell us that we have a buffer. Buffers are fun. We have acetic acid and sodium acetate making up our buffer solution. And then they give us the Ka. And what makes buffers more exciting, besides that they resist changes in pH, is that we can use the equation specific for them, which is that pH is equal to pKa plus the log of base divided by acid. Okay, and this is and this is our Henderson-Hasselbalch equation.